Hello friends, it's Jessica from Three Rivers Homestead, and if you're new here, I am a homesteading and homeschooling mother of eight in Northwest Ohio, and in my videos, I like to share a lot about how we grow and preserve food as well as cook meals from all of that food we preserved for our family of 10. This week, we were able to harvest some of our first produce from the garden. We're enjoying snacking on asparagus and some fresh herbs that are available. So the nature of our meals are going to start changing here as the garden is able to produce more fresh food for us. But you guys know when we're not able to grow fresh food through the winter months, we rely very heavily on our pantry. And this week, my older boys were busy putting together some new shelving for the pantry that's down in our cellar. Adam was able to save this set of shelves from going into the dumpster at work. All the shelves needed were some PVC pipes to hold it together, and it made the perfect little shelving area for this back corner nook in our cellar. And so while I was down there helping them put those shelves together, I was able to assess everything that we have left in food storage from last year's growing season. As you can see, there's still quite a bit of canned food that we need to use up to empty jars for this year's preservation season. So I made a list of everything that I have down there that I need to be intentional about using up. I also got out my little weather stickers for my planner. It's the time of year where I need to start paying attention to the weather to know when we can cook outside in our outdoor kitchen and what needs to be made inside. And then I was able to make a meal plan for the week based on all of that information. So in my meal videos, you guys knew I did a pantry challenge at the beginning of the year and took you through weeks and weeks of meal planning and all of our favorite recipes. So it's getting hard to share things that are new and not redundant with you. But I was able to put together a breakfast and lunch and dinner that I haven't shared with you yet. And so that is what I'm going to cover in this week's video. I just needed to unload all of our goodies from the cellar upstairs in the kitchen so that we can make this week's meals. The nature of breakfast here in our house is really changing. You guys know through, through the winter, we rely very heavily on breakfast meats as well as a lot of baked goods. But we are going to be entering the season where we have other things available. Eggs are in abundance, so we're trying to find creative ways to use those up. And I thought that the first meal, the breakfast that I would share with you this week, was one that was going to use up some eggs in a little bit of a different way that I haven't shown you before. So what we're going to do for that breakfast is start out by taking some whole oat groats. This is the seed of an oat plant. We're running it through our little rolling machine here and we are making some homemade old-fashioned oats. Now, whenever we have oats for breakfast, the night before I soak them in some water with a little bit of lemon juice, that acid helps to break down the phytates in the oats and then helps them to make a little bit more digestible so that we can absorb the nutrients and the minerals, the vitamins that are available in those oats. And then after they soak for about 12 hours, we just drain out that soaking water and then we have some wonderful freshly rolled oats that we can use for breakfast. What we're gonna do today is add eggs to those oats and that's it, just eggs. And I typically add one to two eggs per cup of soaked oats. And then all we're gonna do is blend those two ingredients together and this is gonna be the base for our pancakes. I've shared many times our typical pancake, our wheat-based pancake recipe, and you know, typically that has some kind of leavening agent in it, whether it's a sourdough starter or some kind of baking powder that would make them nice and fluffy. What we're making here is a very egg-based pancake, so it isn't going to rise up and be fluffy. It's going to be more like a crepe texture um, with just the oats and the eggs. So I'm just busy flipping those for the children. You know, we have eight kids, so we have a lot of flipping to do. In the meantime, on the other burner, I had put some frozen blueberries that we preserved last summer that are needing to be used up. They're just in a pan with a little bit of water, and I let that come to a boil. We're gonna make a blueberry syrup out of that for these pancakes. So they're looking wonderful. We're not gonna add any sugar to that blueberry syrup. It's just the blueberries. 
and this is what our stack of little pancakes was looking like. There are our cooked blueberries. I do have maple syrup available for some of the children who want to add that on top of the blueberries. And this just made a wonderful protein rich, full of vitamins between what's in the freshly rolled soaked oats and the vitamins and the minerals that are in the maple syrup. Just a great way to start the day for the children. So if you're looking for a way to use up eggs during this season, but maybe you have children that don't necessarily prefer just to have scrambled eggs, soak a little bit of oats, um, add those eggs to it, whip it together, and you have yourself a wonderful little pancake that they will enjoy eating. These kids went back for seconds and some of them even thirds. They really enjoyed this. Now we're going to move on to lunch. You guys know that through the winter when you saw my meals that I was sharing, lunch was typically some kind of soup or stew. That's something that's really easy for us to make through the busy homeschool season of the winter when we're really hitting the books. But as the weather starts to warm up, I don't know about you guys, but around here we're kind of over soup. Um, it's not something that we enjoy for lunch, so I'm starting to branch out and we're looking at other ideas. And as we have more fresh vegetables and fruits available, lunches will definitely change. But I thought that today I would show you one of the things that I love to make for the children, and that is homemade nachos. We're talking from scratch nachos. So we're going to go ahead and get started. The first thing I need to do is make a nacho sauce. Now, I know I get a lot of criticism from people. Because we're a dairy-free family, people think that I should be buying my children vegan cheese substitutes. And I don't prefer to do that. And that's simply because, first of all, they're very expensive, but they're really expensive for the very little nutrition that they offer. If you look at the ingredients of those vegan cheeses, they're basically just oil and starch. They don't have any vitamins and minerals in them. So when I want to make a cheese sauce, I like to use vegetables to do that. So what I typically start with is some carrots. Now if I had canned carrots down in the pantry, that is ideal because those canned carrots are already cooked up and softened and they're really easy to blend together to make my sauce. But I have used up all of the canned carrots that we had preserved last summer from what we grew in the garden. And so I have fresh carrots in the house. So we're going to go ahead and cook those down. So I'm just starting by cutting them up into little chunks and we're gonna get those on the stove. But first we need to add our second ingredient and that is some home canned squash. So I'm just gonna dump that whole pint of home canned squash in with the carrots. We're gonna add a little bit of extra water and then the liquid, the broth from that squash is going to help um, cook down those carrots. We're gonna sprinkle in a little bit of freeze dried onion. Those will rehydrate in some of the liquid. And then I'm just sitting that on the stove to simmer for maybe about 30 minutes, just long enough to soften those carrots up so that we can blend them together. And that's what that looked like. This is why I love canning carrots because it's a whole lot easier when they're already softened. It's purely for convenience. We're gonna sprinkle in nutritional yeast this is what really gives um, dairy-free cheeses that cheese flavor. It's all about the nutritional yeast. So we just add some of that with a little bit of salt and pepper to taste. And then when we blend that together, we have a fake cheese, a nacho cheese sauce that isn't just oil and starch. It has the nutrition of the carrots and the squash, lots of vitamin A. It has that nutritional yeast that adds a little bit of vitamin B12. And, you know, you do have to lower your expectations. It isn't going to taste like a dairy-based nacho cheese sauce. But it is something with a little bit of that umami cheese flavor that satisfies you um, to dip your corn chip into in replacement of a nacho sauce. So I just use my immersion blender and blend it down to get it as smooth as I possibly can. Now sometimes if I want to make this a little more creamy, I will add some soaked cashews to this when I blend it up. Another thing that works really well is potatoes or sweet potatoes. Anything like that will give you a really creamy cheese substitute. The key to it really is that nutritional yeast to give it that flavor. So if you're like me and you find yourself not wanting to waste your money on the vegan cheeses because they really just don't provide any nutrition for your children, go ahead and experiment with making your own cheese sauces. There's lots of recipes out there if you search it on the internet, but most of them have a base usually in butternut squash or pumpkin or carrots to give it that um, beta carotene, that orange color that kind of reminds you of 
cheese. Let's go ahead and move on to our next ingredient in our homemade nachos. We're gonna make a bean dip. So I have some home canned black beans here. We're just gonna drain those and then get those into our pot. I don't really have a recipe for things like this. I just kind of wing it with what I have available in the house. So it's different every time I make it, but I'm always starting with those home canned black beans. From there, since we have freeze dried onions, we're gonna go ahead and add some of that in there. And then we are gonna grab some bacon fat from our grease pot here. That is the key to a great bean dip, is that bacon flavor from the fat. I also added a little bit of the brine from some pickled peppers, some salt and pepper, and then I think later on, I didn't show it, I did add a little bit of cumin to this. Um, but then just like with the nacho cheese sauce, we're gonna stir this together. We're gonna get it on the stove, allow those uh, freeze dried onions to be rehydrated by that pepper brine that's in there. We just need that bacon fat to kind of melt down a little bit. And then when we're done, we can get this into a bowl and then use that immersion blender again to blend it up into a lovely bean dip for dipping our chips into. So since we can't have dairy in the house because of my son's anaphylactic dairy allergy, there is a risk of cross-contamination. If we had any dairy in the kitchen, it would be unsafe for him. Let's say I was feeding it to one of the other children and somehow it ended up through the dishes um, ending up on Gabriel's plate and in his food, he could die from anaphylaxis. So that's why none of us have dairy in the house. And so when I make something like nachos where we can't have regular cheese or sour cream, I really like to have as many dipping options available for the children as possible. And I'll show you all of those after we go ahead and make those corn chips. So to make our corn chips from scratch, we're starting with some masa harina. So this is corn flour that is made from corn that has been nixtamalized. I probably mispronounced that, but bear with me here. That is corn that was soaked in lime, lime water, and that helps make the corn much more digestible. So this is a very different product than just running a whole corn through your grain mill, this was soaked beforehand. So I put about two and a half cups of that masa harina into my bowl here, and then I'm adding water. I think in total I ended up adding a little bit under two cups of warm water. You do want it to be warm, but really it's different how much water I add every time. You're just trying to get it to the appropriate texture. So you add a little bit of water, you wait, you let it soak up, um, you want to be able to form this dough into a ball that doesn't really crack. And so it does just take a little bit of practice to learn how much water you need to add to it. And um, so just stirring it up well, giving it a little bit of time, set it aside and let that moisture really absorb into the corn flour. And then you can test it a little later on and see how that dough forms into a ball for you. You don't want it to be so wet that it's sticky and you don't want it to be so dry that it crumbles. Here is our tortilla press. This is a cast iron um, tortilla press that I got from Amazon. I'll link it in the video description. Um, it sits in storage and we only use this maybe once a month. So every time I get it out, it needs to have a good cleaning to get any dust off of it so that that dust doesn't end up in the tortillas that we're making. So I am definitely not an expert tortilla maker. Um, I learned everything that I know from watching videos of very talented Mexican chefs do their thing. And so if you really want to learn how to make good tortillas, you should really check out an authentic Mexican chef for that. But to make sure that our masa dough doesn't stick to the tortilla press, I take a little Ziploc bag like this and cut it up the way I showed you, and that allows you to press down that dough and have it peel off without sticking to your press. And then to make my chips, I just cut it into little pie shapes. I have some home rendered beef tallow on the stove in a pot that's bubbling, and so we are deep frying these little slices of tortilla in that, and that is how we're gonna make our corn chips. So if you don't have a plastic bag, parchment paper works really well for this, but you do really need something to prevent that dough from sticking to your tortilla press or you're gonna have a huge mess on your hands. Now I'm gonna be honest with you, I do not always make my corn chips from scratch. We do purchase store-bought 
tortilla chips a lot of the time, but I always keep some masa flour in the house for the times that we run out because we only do our grocery shopping once a month. And then if it's a time where I don't have any in the house and I want to make some nachos, it gives me an opportunity to work on these skills and make them from scratch. And I thought I would share it with you. So if you want to learn about how to render your own beef tallow or lard, I will put a video in the description for you that shows how I've done that before. But these taste amazing. When you've got these homemade chips in the tallow, they have that slight beef hint. They're really delicious. I just sprinkle a little bit of salt on them while they're still wet from the fat and they're cooling down. And here are all of our sides. We have our bean dip. We have our little nacho cheese sauce, and that's what it looks like. I have some home canned salsa from last year's garden, and we're working on using that up. That was all homegrown ingredients from our property last year. Just a little bit of homegrown beef with some taco flavoring, some pickled banana peppers, and then this is store-bought taco sauce because if you've been around here a while, you know that I've had a lot of trouble figuring out how to can a taco sauce that my children like. So here is one of the plates of one of my older children and how they preferred to eat their nachos. It's just a really simple lunch. I know that in putting this video together, it looks like that was a lot of work, but it really wasn't. All of the side dishes came together in just maybe 20 minutes. And then I just sat there chatting with the children at the counter while I was rolling out my tortillas and deep frying them. So in all, I had maybe a little bit over an hour invested in making this meal for my children. And it was a nice break from the typical soups and sandwiches and things that we have for lunch. Now let's move on to a dinner. So I have an oxtail that was in the freezer and I have one bag here, the last bag of garden tomatoes from 2023. And I don't know how this slipped by me. I just haven't turned it into anything else. So I decided today was the day I was going to use up both of these items that have been in the freezer being neglected. So the first thing I need to do is get both of these things in a baking dish. We're going to go ahead and defrost them in the oven. I did not plan ahead well. I got busy the night before with children's activities and forgot to thaw these items. So just a little bit of time in the oven was able to thaw these out. And then once those tomatoes were soft, I could pour them into my crock pot here. I'm going to go ahead and blend those tomatoes up with my immersion blender. And that is going to be the base for our oxtail soup. And I know what you guys are thinking. Some of you have probably never had an oxtail before and the thought is just disgusting to you. But let me tell you, the meat that's around the tail is so tender. It just falls right off the bone. And then because that tail is full of these bones, when you slowly simmer this in the crock pot all day, it makes the most delicious and rich broth. So this is a, a part of the animal that's often wasted, but it makes an amazing soup. Do not waste this part of your cow. And so we're going to sprinkle in a little more. We've been using a lot of these freeze-dried onions. I'm going to add two cubes of garlic scape puree that we preserved last year. This is the flowering part of the garlic plant that we turn into a little garlic balm. And then, of course, for our soup, we're going to add some carrots since that's what we have fresh in the house. At this point, when I'm making a soup like this, I kind of wing it every time and just add whatever um, vegetables we have fresh available or what we have preserved that needs to be used up. So I added some carrots and then I have a lot of freeze dried kale from last year's garden still sitting in jars. So I'm going to sprinkle some of that into our soup. And then I also have some freeze dried celery. This was both the ribs of the celery and some of the greens. That'll give some great flavor to our soup as well. And then because we added all of those freeze dried items, it's going to absorb a lot of water. And so we need to add a little bit of extra water to um, account for that. And then that extra water will turn into lovely broth from our oxtail. I'm just going to stir that around. And then I'm sitting there thinking about what else would be a good addition to this soup. Of course, we need to add our salt and pepper and then any other herbs that you would like to have. And that's it. Um, that's basically the base of this. We're going to get this in the crock pot. I'm going to have it on low for the majority of the day. And then you'll see that in a little bit, um, we are going to add some potato. 
because this is a really busy evening for us. We had um, dance and karate on that night for the children. So I wanted to get this going in the crock pot early in the day and then a little closer to the point we had to leave for our activities. I chopped up those potatoes and added them in. And then by the time we got home that night, the potatoes were cooked, but they weren't turned to complete mush. Had I added them earlier in the day, they would have been so softened. They would have been like mashed potatoes in our soup. So we got home that night a little bit after six from our activities, and I still need to do one more thing before I can serve this soup. I'm going to scoop out those pieces of tail, and as I mentioned, the meat just sort of falls off the bone. In fact, a lot of the meat had already fallen off and was in the crock pot already, but I'm just taking what was remaining. I had to scoop out the bones, and we're going to shred the meat off of the rest of the bones, and then we can return that meat back to the soup. So as I mentioned at the beginning of the video, we are still working through a lot of things that are in the pantry and the freezer, and this oxtail was one of those items. Um, we had processed two heifers the year before, and so I had two tails. I had used one during the pantry challenge, and so I had this one left. Where we still have a little bit of other organ meat to use up. Um, but we are definitely getting low on beef that isn't canned. And we next week will be taking our steer in to be processed. So I am really excited about that to have some cuts of meat that we have been missing back in the freezer. And so this is what our soup looked like. Served it with a little bit of bread. And the children loved it. And even knowing that it's the tail, the little ones still ate it and loved it because around here, what's the difference between meat that comes from a tail and meat that comes from a leg or a rib or whatever we're used to eating? It's all the same. It all tastes amazing. We're not going to let those cuts go to waste. So spring is in full bloom around here. The apple trees blossomed. This is our wild plum tree that's blossomed. It has a beautiful morning dove sitting on a nest in there. I'm just enjoying how everything around me is coming to life. I was able to get into the garden and enjoy the beautiful weather this week. I got two beds of cabbage planted and covered up with some row cover. I've had terrible um, results growing brassicas over the last couple of years. The cabbage moths have definitely won the war over the last couple of years. And so this year I am determined to win it. And I think that by covering with some of this row cover, um, hopefully the cabbage moths won't be able to get to my plants. So other than that, my spring garden is basically planted at this point. We've done potatoes and onions. We did another bed of asparagus, some strawberries. We've got broccoli and cabbage planted. I've done my first round of lettuce. We did carrots, spinach, radishes, and lots of herbs. And then at this point, I'm just waiting for our last frost date, which is typically Mother's Day weekend, and then we can start planting out all of the other beautiful plant starts that we have growing in the kitchen. We have our tomatoes and peppers to do, lots of squash, and other fun things. I'm very excited as the weather changes and the garden begins to become productive to share with you some of the meals now that we make using the fresh things that are coming out of our garden. I heavily focus typically on using up the things that we've preserved but I haven't done a lot of meal sharing during the growing season using fresh ingredients. So you'll see a lot of that content coming up as well as the usual food preservation content all throughout the summer. And I'm really excited that we have a new growing season started so that I'm able to do that again with you this year. And I'm hoping here in a coming video to kind of give you some ideas on how my food preservation goals have changed this year because they definitely have changed. And I'm gonna be sharing my goals and some ideas and we can sit down and brainstorm together on how to plan for a really successful food preservation year. Until then, I hope you guys have a wonderful week. We will be back next week with another video and I pray that you are blessed friends. Bye.